what are the sensors doing when they're collect, you know, sort of turning inputs from the environment into data? Mm -hmm. How are those data being put through models that are segmenting and categorizing those data in certain ways? And, um, you know, some transparency into what that looks like and asking the right questions, uh, understanding what data we're collecting and what data we're leaving out, understanding how to present those data to various audiences that have differing levels of sophistication about how to make sense out of the phenomena that we're interested in. And then some kind of rudimentary understanding of statistics because statistics are being increasingly deployed by data scientists to make recommendations about courses of action. And if we don't understand how those statistics are being constructed, we're gonna have problems. Welcome to part two of my interview with Paul Leonardi, co-author of The Digital Mindset, What It Really Takes to Thrive in the Age of Data, Algorithms, and Artificial Intelligence, published by Harvard Business Review Press. If you've not done so, I encourage you to watch part one of our interview first, and you'll find the link up here. Now, consider this. According to an HBR article called 11 Trends That Will Shape Work in 2022, one trend highlighted is this. Managerial tasks will be automated away, creating space for managers to build more human relationships with their employees. The next generation of technology will start to replace additional managerial tasks, such as providing performance feedback and supporting employees in building new peer-to-peer -peer connections. Our research shows that up to 65% of the tasks that a manager currently does has the potential to be automated by 2025. And I'll put a link to this article in the show notes. Hi, this is Peter Clayton, host of the Total Picture Podcast. I focus on HR technology, TA tech, recruiting, talent acquisition, and career strategies. Today, I'm joined again by Paul Leonardi, the Duca Family Professor of Technology Management at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Paul's co-author is Sidel Neely. She's the Naylor Fitzhugh Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School, an award-winning scholar, teacher, and expert on virtual and global work. Paul, welcome back. As I mentioned in my intro, I'd like to return to the three major approaches to the digital mindset used in your book, one, collaboration, two, computation, and three, change. Can you briefly describe each of these and why they work together to create a digital mindset. Sure. So if you recall, when we defined earlier what a digital mindset is, I said a mindset is a, a set of approaches we use to make sense out of an act in the world. And we really took that definition to heart and said, okay, well, then what are the approaches to the world that you need to operate from in order to be successful in the digital age? And collaboration, computation, and change are the three approaches that really emerged from our analysis and our, our work with all these, uh, these people that we really identified as, as having really strong and well-developed digital mindsets. And an approach to collaboration, I think, makes sense to most people. They're like, yeah, I've got, I've got an approach to collaboration, right? There's ways that I know how to interact and like to interact with other people. I think often strategically about who I'm going to work with, and how I'm going to work with them. So people are comfortable and often familiar with an approach to collaboration. And our suggestion, perhaps argument, is that we need to shift our approach to collaboration a bit in the digital age on a couple of key dimensions. One relates to the conversation that we just had about uh, chatbots and AI powered agents. And that is that we are increasingly um, seeing these kinds of technologies not just be tools that we use, but tools that we interact with as though they were teammates or people. Um, this is uh, happening often in manufacturing contexts. We're seeing it happen in the military. Uh, we're starting to see it happen within decision-making um, groups and task forces and large organizations that these kinds of tools act as decision aids in kind of real world um, live decision-making contexts. And so you have to kind of think, you know, when you when I say collaboration, usually collaborating with a technology doesn't jump to mind. We think that technology is the medium through which we are collaborating with people. But the shift that we need is in thinking about how do we actually 
bring a machine into our collaboration and as, as a partner. And so we give a number of tips and, and ways of thinking about that. We also discuss how now in the digital era, our work, our relationships, our interactions are much more likely to be distributed across time and space. And this is a, you know, a pattern that's been um, growing for some time that really escalated during the pandemic with this you know, wholesale shift to remote work. And now we're in this flux of like, well, what, is, what does work look like now? People in different geographies and different time zones. And what that means is that uh, the kinds of activities that we do to collaborate with other people need to change in some ways. Um, it, no longer we can take for granted that, you know, uh, people see us and they know what we're doing and they see us working hard. That just doesn't happen because they talk to us on Zoom every so often, right? Or they see the outputs of our work, but because we're geographically or physically distributed, they don't necessarily see what we're doing every day. And so we argue that we need to develop an approach to collaboration that allows us to really build and enhance and establish our own digital presence so that we're present to other people uh, our collaborators, even when we're not physically co-located, and that we kind of recalibrate how we make attributions about other people's behavior when we are not co-located and we're not able to uh, sort of resolve the ambiguities in their response by quickly asking them a question or seeing some seeing that you know traffic was uh, there's a lot of traffic on the way to the office today, and so that's of course why that person would be late. So developing and kind of changing our approach to collaboration is the first major approach that we talk about. The second is computation. And when we talk to really technical folks in companies, they're like, oh yeah, 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 I know computation, totally get it. When we talk to people that are not necessarily really technically sophisticated or don't work in technical roles, they're like, what do you mean? And I have to approach computation in a certain way. I don't even get what that means. And uh, our argument here is pretty simple, and that is that we really need to understand the production of data, the way that data are presented, and we need to understand how to have confidence in interpreting results that are being presented, predictions that are being made based on the analysis of those data. And that involves developing some rudimentary skills in areas that uh, we talked about a little bit before, you know, including understanding you know, what are the what are the sensors doing when they're collect, you know, sort of turning inputs from the environment into data? Mm -hmm. How are those data being put through models that are segmenting and categorizing those data in certain ways? And, um, you know, some transparency into what that looks like and asking the right questions, um, understanding what data we're collecting and what data we're leaving out, understanding how to present those data to various audiences that have differing levels of sophistication about how to make sense out of the phenomena that we're interested in. And then some kind of rudimentary understanding of statistics because statistics are being increasingly deployed by data scientists to make recommendations about courses of action. And if we don't understand how those statistics are being constructed, we're gonna have problems. Um, you know, uh, Danny Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for something called prospect theory in the 1990s. Um, and the basic insight was that humans are really bad at probabilistic reasoning. It's really difficult for us to understand probabilities and statistics are all about probabilities. So we need to develop some kind of uh, fluency in that. And we try to give a bit of a primer on, on what you need to know, even if you're not a data scientist. And then the third and final approach is about change. And the way that I like to categorize it is as follows, that we, we typically think of change as something that happens occasionally, right? That we have long kind of periods of harmony and stasis and things are staying the same. And then there's a, a moment that comes, right? A series of events and a big change happens. And then things are relatively calm for a certain period of time. And then another change event occurs. That may have been a useful way of thinking about the world uh, you know, pre-digital, but today it's kind of an outdated approach. And that's because everything that we do, right, in our, uh, the information environment and the technologies that we use and the decisions we need to make and customer preferences and the uh, demands of our employees are just in a constant process of change. You know, there aren't these periods of stasis anymore. It's like once we finally think we, you know, can put our head above the water and take a deep breath, the waves start to splash us in the face again. So mm -hmm. we, we really say, sort of urge that your approach to change needs to recognize 
that we're always sort of transitioning from one technology to another, from one data set to another, from one strategic initiative to another, and that don't ever expect to like be able to pull up a chair and, and put your feet up for a while because change is always happening. But if you reorient to change in that way, you can start to see new possibilities for action. And we talk about this in three key areas. One is about uh, cybersecurity and privacy. So if you recognize that the tools that we're using are embedded in an ecosystem of other tools that are themselves changing, you recognize that there's going to be a security breach. There's going to be a problem at some point because you just can't manage all of the interfaces and keep everything steady. And if you recognize that, then you can develop a new approach for how you deal with privacy issues and security issues. Um, we talk about this in terms of experimentation, that one way to deal with this constant process of change that's occurring is to, rather than make big decisions and hope they stick, to really try much smaller experiments. And we talk about how do you develop an ethos of experimentation within your organization? How do you make sure that departmentalization doesn't kill uh, experimentation at the fringes? And how do you democratize the idea of experimentation so that anybody can do it? And then finally, we talk about you know, the importance of leading cultural change and developing a culture that is resilient to this tr constant transition that's happening. And how do you upskill people and how do you implement new tools and ways that get them to see the utility of them? Um, and so this approach to change as this constant process of transitioning is really important. So we give lots of examples and stories um, from great uh, individuals and organizations that have managed to do this well. Yeah, I think that is so important. I mean, it, it, an example right now, obviously, is the struggle many companies are going through, you know, with hybrid uh, work arrangements or bringing people back to the office. People don't want to go back to the office. They like working from home. Uh, you know, so how do you approach all of this and find an equilibrium uh, where you can keep your best employees, which they all want to do? And, uh, and yet, you know, achieve what you're trying to accomplish as a business. Right. right. And it surprises me when I read about all of these, um, you know, major decisions that companies are making around the return to work or hybrid work, how they're presented as though, like, we've come up with the answer, right. you know, it's yeah. going to be two days in the office, right? Pick your days. It's going to be Monday through Wednesday and you know, Thursday, Friday in our office, you don't have to come in or, or, you know, wh whatever the thing is. Right. That, that yeah, look, look at Apple trying to get everybody back to the spaceship, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think those kinds of broad prognoses, right, or these big statements about this is what we're going to do, don't really reflect an evolved digital mindset, you know, around this idea of experimentation. Because look, look at the, um, the quick evolution of tools that have happened just in the last two years. I mean, the ability to have these kinds of video conferences at this high level of fidelity, the way that we can like share files and co-work on those files in real time. I mean, capabilities and the technologies themselves have been exploding. The, the needs, right, of our uh, employees have been shifting pretty rapidly. And there's, there's no reason to believe that those transitions, either in technology or in, uh, you know, worker preference, are likely to slow down. And so right. it makes little sense to say, here's our approach to hybrid work. I think what would make better sense is to have more of this experimentation mindset and to say, we're going to try this approach, right? Or we're going to mm -hmm. try these couple of different approaches and we're going to see which ones help us to sort of maximize productivity, but also employ well-being, which ones make help us to create and maintain a strong culture, yet still giving people enough individual freedoms that they can, you know, uh, kind of manage their own lives around their work. Um, I think that is the better move in this, the, the way the world is now, right? Is to say, we're trying a series of experiments. We're going to see what works and what doesn't work. We're going to learn from them. And then we can start developing policies that are adaptive to future change, rather than come out and say, our policy is X and everyone's right, going to do it. Right. Yeah. I mean, when I launched Zoom this morning, there's a thing 
we now have a whiteboard implementation in Zoom, you know? Uh-huh. So I mean, it's, it's that kind of thing. It's just constantly changing and evolving and what you can do and, and how you can use, use tools like Zoom. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been wonderful for me because everybody has upgraded their system. They're now, you know, they all have nice cameras now. They have mics and, it, you know, so for what I do, it's, it's fantastic. Right. Um, what, one thing I'd, I'd like you to address, Paul, because you did speak about this in your book, and that is, uh, I'd like you to touch on blockchain because a lot of people just relate it to cryptocurrency. And you know, what do you, we need to know about blockchain for our careers and our jobs? Yeah, um, that's, that's a good question. So we give kind of a, a primer on mm-hmm. what is blockchain because I think like you, most people um, say they hear blockchain, crypto, they think those are related, not quite sure how. And what we want to do is give people a good framework for understanding what that is. And, you know, blockchain is really a distributed ledger system. And it allows for entries into a kind of centralized, well, it's decentralized, but think of it as like a public database, right? where everybody can see what entries you're making and know that those entries uh, are being watched by others so that you can't fudge them in any particular way. And so there's an increasing um, fidelity to data that are possible and potential reliability to transactions that are occurring via blockchain. And we give some examples in the book about how this works. In particular, the diamond market has really Mm -hmm. benefited from, um, from the use of blockchain. How is blockchain exactly being embedded in business in a way that uh, everybody should understand? We don't really know exactly yet, right? We're still really in the infancy of blockchain. Um, But we thought that what made sense was if we could give kind of an overarching preview of like, well, what is blockchain and what are some potential ways in which it can be useful? uh, We can help people begin to appreciate the opportunities that exist for enhance security and reliability um, in their ledgers and in their transactions so that we might be able to start imagining new and better ways that blockchain can be useful in our businesses. So I think the exciting thing is that we're kind of in the wild west, right, in terms of where, where could blockchain go, but it does really represent a fundamental shift uh, in core technological capabilities that has the potential to reshape many of the ways that we record keep and we conduct our transactions and organizations. Paul, I, I really appreciate your, your time today. I, I'd like to finish up um, our interview with this. There's a really a fabulous five-star review of your book on Amazon written by a guy whose name is Robert Miller, who is in the Hall of Fame, whatever that is. And his review starts with this. Um, here's a prediction from Alvin Toffler in 1970, quote, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn, and unquote. And so to me, that, that sums up what really takes to adopt the, the digital mindset that, that you're writing about, right? It does. And one of the key elements that we discuss throughout the book and really, really double down on in the the second to last chapter, the one on transitioning, is about the importance of continuous learning. Right. That, um, you know, gone are the days when, you know, you uh, went to high school, you went to college, you learned some stuff, you then applied throughout the rest of your career. No, that doesn't happen, right? We we need to be in a continuous state of, of learning. And we provide in the book that foundation, I think, to get you the 30% in the various areas that we cover. Um, and you can think of that as like building a foundation, but the structure on top of that foundation is going to continue to change. And so we need to continuously learn about advances in new technologies. We need to learn about advances in computer program. We need to learn about advances in how we collaborate uh, with people that are distributed. We need to learn about you know, how we continually upskill our employee workforce. And we end the book with some case studies from both high tech and and frankly, not very high tech organizations that have done a really good job of Mm -hmm. helping to develop programs by which their employees can learn digital skills continuously. But I think that the biggest, biggest thing that's important about this is humility. 
um, recognizing that I don't know everything, that things are going to change, and I'm going to have to be a lifelong learner. And right. I know that was really important for me to help get me to the, the 30% or beyond mm-hmm. in some cases, is to say, even though I've got a PhD from you know a, a college of engineering, right, at a top research university, uh, I that was 20 years ago now, right? Like, I don't know everything. And I've had to take more classes and refresher courses online and in person to continually build and rebuild my skills. And that takes a certain amount of humility to do. But I think if we can recognize that, we're going to be in really good shape to be good learners. Yeah, I really love the 30% concept because that just tells you, well, I don't have to know everything about everything. I can just know if I know this much, I will be competent enough to converse with people who know a lot more and learn something. That's right. I I think it's brilliant. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, So how can our listeners and viewers connect with you and your work? Yeah, well, um, you know, uh, getting a copy of the book hopefully is a great first start to start getting that 30%. Um, you know, you can follow me on Twitter at PLeonardi1. I'm also on LinkedIn and love to connect there. And I'm pretty engaged and like to respond to comments and interact with folks. And you can find me at uh, paulleonardi.com also for lots of other articles and teasers and things that uh, hopefully help you to develop and keep developing your digital mindset. Well, great. Thanks again, Paul. The book is The Digital Mindset, What Really Takes to Thrive in the Age of Data, Algorithms, and AI. And it's published by Harvard Business Review Press. And here it is. And I uh, really encourage everyone to pick up a copy of the book. There'll be a link uh, to my Amazon affiliate account down in the show notes. So um, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And until next time, uh, have a good day. Great conversation today. Thank you for tuning into part two of my interview with Paul Leonardi. If you enjoy this content, I'd appreciate your subscribing to the channel. It'll really help to attract new viewers. My name is Peter Clayton, and stay tuned to the Total Picture Podcast by hitting the bell icon. Hope to see you soon.